actually, that, that's, I only have two slides. The next one is just give up. It's, give it's up. Hard. <laughs> so, uh, so you're all very lucky because you get to watch the first time I give this talk and I was just finishing the slides like three minutes. Like I've been changing this like down to the very last second. So I at this point have no idea how long this talk is. It might be an hour, it might be 20 minutes, who knows. Um, but anyway, so what this, what this talk is, is um, last year at some point, um, I, uh, my role at my company uh, changed a bit and I started kind of running a, a small research team. Um, and so one of the things that I was really interested in uh, immediately was figuring out could we do load balancing better? Because what everybody seems to do, and there are certainly exceptions to this, but what everybody seems to do is use random or round robin. Um, and that struck me as odd because we're software engineers and mathematicians and computer scientists and that's the best we can do? Really? Um, so spoilers for this talk, uh, I have nothing to sell you other than, uh, well, a, a CDN, because uh, that's where I work, I work at Fastly. Um, and I don't have a solution for this problem that I'm gonna describe to you. Uh, so the, the idea with this is to be informational. Um, I, I spent all this time doing all this research and I didn't want it to just sit on my laptop going to waste. Um, so I wanted to like stand up here and share the things I learned and hopefully it's interesting to you and maybe you'll have solutions for me as well. Um, right, so I'm Tyler, uh, I'm the CTO at Fastly. You can find me on the internets at, wow, that's really small. That's a bummer. Okay, so it's at TB McMullen on Twitter. This might be a problem actually with the small text. Right, so what is load balancing? Um, right, I, oh, right, I did mention that I didn't have, uh, still working on these slides. <laughs> Shit. Um, okay, okay, that's fine. How about we have, we're, we're gonna have an allegory of load balancing instead. Uh, so this is a story that, uh, that was told by uh, someone who I work with named Human Beheshti back in 1998. Um, he's a former CTO of Radware and Strange Loop, so like, he, he knows load balancing. He's like one of the like, original people who like, worked on layer seven load balancing. Um, and, and now he sits across from me at work, uh, so oh how the mighty have fallen. Um, <laughs> right, so the story, the story goes like this. Most everybody here has probably has probably been to a sporting event before. You've all been to a stadium. It might be s soccer or football or American football or baseball or rugby or whatever other sports. About. You guys like cricket, right? That's the one? <laughs> okay. Um, and at some point during basically every sporting event, there's this moment where you've been sitting there either really enjoying the game or pretending that you were really enjoying the game in my case, um, where you basically, you stand up and you go, okay, everybody else stands up because it's the break the break, it's the point when everybody stands up and what do they do? They wanna go get a beer. Um, and so, they all walk out into the corridors of the stadium and there are many, many choices for where you're gonna get your beer, right? Or maybe you're gonna use the bathroom or maybe you're gonna get a snack, but like the, it holds across all of these. And so, this is actually a, a great way to describe load balancing because you could certainly just walk out into that corridor and you could go to the very first one. You go to the very first booth that you come to, but then, you don't know, like, how long is the line at that booth? How long, maybe, maybe it has less workers working at it, and so it's gonna be slower even if the line is shorter. Uh, maybe, maybe if you walked a little further, you could actually reduce the time to get your beer and get back to your seat. And so this, this idea of, like, trying to spread load so it's as even as possible so that everyone has the best possible experience, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing as load balancing, right? So why do we load balance? I actually find the name to be a bit of a misnomer because I think that the primary reasons why people use load, use load balancers is not actually for balancing load. Um, I think the real reasons why people, wow, that is really small, okay, great. Um, so the real reasons why people use load balancing are actually a couple things. One is abstraction. Um, so the first thing being like, you know, treating many servers as one, giving you one single entry point into this cluster of servers. And it's like, it's essentially a simplification, right? Um, and the second reason would be failure, right? So you want your load balancer to be able to like transparently fail over like when a server dies. Um, you also wanna be able to like recover seamlessly when a server comes back up. Um, and again, so like this, like this, this use of load balancers as this failure mechanism is again a simplification. 
And then, and then the third one, like I think it's a distant third in a lot of cases, is actually balancing of the load. Is actually like the performance, the like uh, efficiently doing this thing. Um, and I think like if you notice those first two, abstraction and failure, and like failover, um, they're both for simplification, right? And I think that that's one of the reasons why we end up using random because it's the like simplest possible thing you could do. And so that brings me to random. The inglorious default. It's the thing that is in every load balancer and it's the bane of my existence at this point. Um, so that's a bit of an overstatement though. So like there are some really good things about random load balancing. Uh, the first one is simplicity of course. Um, and then th that second one is really important as well. So having few edge cases. Like there are very few things that can go wrong with random in a catastrophic way. Whereas if any of you have tried to use like least cons, especially like in a distributed load balancer setup, I, I heard someone describe it recently, actually last night at the drink up, as the finger of death, where the load balancers all go, oh, that one has no load, bam. And then that server is dead. <laughs> so, so random is also good like for that failover prospect, right? All you do is you just stop sending requests to a particular node. Um, and, the other really cool thing, and we'll like get into like the distributed load balancing stuff later, is that it requires no changes if you have multiple load balancers. You just continue running random and it's still random. So what's bad about random? Latency, latency, capacity, efficiency, latency. Um, and we'll, we'll get into this, but like the reason, the reason for why random is bad for this. And I think that like this is something I didn't know until I started doing this research. Like I knew that like random wasn't going to be like great, but I didn't know why exactly that would be the case. It all comes back to this one thing and it's a classic problem in probability theory. It's called balls into bins, right? And so the way this problem is described says if you throw m balls into n bins, what is the maximum load? of any one bin that you're throwing balls into, right? So the obvious answer to this question is, well, it could be M. You could have thrown all the balls into like one single bin at random, but that's incredibly, incredibly unlikely, right? So the real question is like, what is, what is the maximum load on any one of these bins with high likelihood? Like what is, what is like highly likely to occur in every case? And so, okay. I had read about this problem before and I realized that it probably applies to load balancing and so I went back and read some of the papers again that I had been reading back in the past. And one of them is this one. It's probably like the, the, the seminal paper on this. Um, it's interesting. Uh, so, what was I saying here? Right, okay. <laughs> so, oh yeah, animations. So one of, this is gonna be an, an exciting thing for you all to experience as I go through my slides. You can see that it starts out with like animations and everything is really nice and then slowly it descends into madness at the end because I'm like running out of time, oh God. Um, right, so, but calculating like what is this highly, like what is that highly likely number? Um, because it's not gonna be even most of the time, right? But there's some way to calculate like what is the maximum like number of balls in a single bin for this case? And, it turns out that it, it's, it's kind of complicated. Um, so in the case where m equals n, the, the same number, then you can use that formula. Um, and then in the case where m is greater than or equal to n log n, you can use that formula. Um, and then, let me scroll down there, and <laughs> more generally, <laughs> that is the actual answer. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm a programmer, I'm an engineer, uh, I, I, am, I am not a mathematician, I have no idea what a polylog is. Um, and so I, I did what, what any one of us here would probably do, which is I, I just slapped together a script to you know, try to come up with like, try to get an idea for like what actually happens, right? So we're, we're gonna like continue building on this example, so I hope people can read this, um, but I'll, I'll walk through it really quickly. Um, so uh, up there we're just using NumPy just to simplify some things. So we have our N, which in this case is eight. So we have eight servers that we're going to, eight bins, let's say, that we're going to be load balancing over. And in this case, M is gonna be a thousand. So we have a thousand balls or requests in this case, right? So we set up our bins and then we are going to generate a bunch of random integers between zero and N. 
right? So in order to choose the servers, we iterate over those, and then we just increment the bucket. We increment the bins for each one of these. So this is just simulating that exact same thing. So if we go through this, we run through that code, and what you end up with uh, is, is something like this. It's not gonna be this every time, of course, but this is a pretty typical run of this. Uh, and the two numbers that I have highlighted there in red are the lowest and highest, right? And so this is, it, it's choosing them at like, like a completely even distribution, right? And so like at, at first one might think, oh, okay, well this is probably, they're gonna all be like right around 125, but it's not actually the case. Most of the time there will be one or two that are like complete outliers, either high or low. Um, right, so this is, this is great for just modeling like the balls and bins problem, but this, this isn't really quite what load balancing is. So let's, let's build on this a little bit. Um, okay, so in this case, requests don't actually all take the same amount of time. Every request is not one. It's not one second, it's not one millisecond. It's not like every request is different in the exact amount of time that it takes. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna put that, we're gonna like put that concept in here. Okay, so now in this case what we're doing is we generate M weights that happen, uh, that are between zero and two with a uniform distribution. So it still averages out to be one for most of them, right? So like overall it's going to be putting in the same amount of weight that we were in the last example, but now each of them are going to be between zero and two, like some, some fraction of that. So we iterate over those, we increment our bins, we add this up, um, and you see that we end up with, with fairly similar results in this case. But this still isn't right because we're not modeling that request latency correct. This is, this is the other part. This is why load balancing is hard. How do you model request latency? Um, I have a concern. There's stairs behind me and I'm definitely gonna fall off at some point. Um, so, right, before they can truly understand how we can improve this and like what random is actually doing and why it's not great, um, we need to understand how to model this request latency. Um, and so before, the, in that last example, that last little Python script, we were selecting that number from between zero and two with an average of one in a uniform distribution, right? That's, that's the part that we're doing wrong, I think. Um, so what, what requests actually typically, what requests to basically any web server in the world will typically follow is what's called a log normal distribution. So, um, it, it's actually kind of amazing how they all follow this. Like, so what I, what I ended up doing is I um, logged into some of the machines in the CDN in, in Fastly and just anonymously pulled like request latencies from like from specific backends and like servers, and they all basically look like that. It's this exponential curve. It's what's called a log normal curve, um, and like. The, the, the slope is different for each of them, but it turns out that you can, like, by modifying the parameters of the log normal curve, you can model basically any web services request latency, which is really cool to me. Um, right, so, so let's look at this, right? So you can see that in this, in this, particular, in this particular distribution that we have displayed up there, um, the mean of this is actually one. Uh, and right, because the text is really small, you can't see that like the maximum that this goes up to is actually 35, right? So like at the very end of that long tail latency curve there, this is actually getting up to 35, but the average of this entire curve is one. And so let's, let's walk through it a little bit. The 50th is 0.6, 75th is 1.2, 95th is 3.1, this is getting exciting, 99th is 6.0, 99.9 .9 is all the way up to 14.1, right? So I find this interesting because what is this going to do to our little script that is modeling this balls into bins, this like, this load balancing problem for us? Let's look. So, right, let me walk through this a little bit. So up there we have our mu and we have our sigma, which are both parameters for this log normal curve. Um, Mu of zero basically just means it's gonna have an average of zero, um, which we'll then do stuff with, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the sigma is the part that controls the slope of the curve, right? And this is the part that you end up modifying if you wanna model the request latency of different web services. Um, 1.15 seemed to be like a pretty reasonable measure. It was like kind of in the middle, it's like a typical website, is a sigma 1.15 for long normal distribution. Um, 
so, right, so then we, we, we use this mathematical formula to find the mean of this so that we can then normalize it to whatever we want. We go through and we select our values from that log normal distribution. NumPy is great if you're not, if you, if you need to do this kind of thing, great. Um, and then we select again our bin at random, we normalize it with that function that we used, and we increment our bins, right? So what is this one gonna look like? That is way, way more skewed. Um, and so this is, this is why, like, getting the model correct for this kind of thing is actually, I think, really important. So in this case, like, we have the same servers, we have the same mean, we have, everything is, like, theoretically the same, except we change the distribution, which dramatically changes the variance in that balls and bins problem, which dramatically uh, makes it, like, which makes the load balancing of this much harder. Okay, we can then improve this just one step further, um, by adding in a baseline, right? Because no request actually takes zero seconds, right? Nothing actually takes zero time. So we add in a baseline. In this case, let's, let's say our, our mean is one, like, let's say that's one second, and our baseline is 0.05, so 50 milliseconds. That's like the lowest it can possibly be for any request. Um, and then we walk through and exactly, it's like exactly the same code, and we end up with something fairly similar again. But this is what we're gonna then build off of later. Um, however, this is, this is the interesting thing. This is, this is why this talk is entitled Low Balancing is Impossible, right? Because of the fact that every request is different, because every request is almost certainly drawn from this log normal distribution, the load balancer cannot possibly know what the right way to balance the load is for these particular requests. It cannot, like, it, it doesn't know, like, it doesn't actually have the ability to know how long a request is gonna take beforehand which affects how well it can decide to load balance the requests that are coming into it. This is why load balancing is actually impossible. So even an algorithm that balances requests correctly is still going to balance the weight wrong. Does that make sense? Yes. Woo. Okay, so why is that a problem? Um, because of two things. Um, right, so when requests get sent to a web server, you send a whole bunch of them to one, you send heavy, like you send a bunch of like really heavy requests to one, or you send one heavy request to one and a bunch of small requests to one, what's gonna happen? Well, they're gonna end up either queuing or they're going to be running in parallel, right? And so if they're queuing, if they're queuing behind that large request, it means that not only is that large request gonna be slow, it means that all of those small requests that are waiting behind it are gonna be slow. Or in the case that it's going to be trying to run them in parallel, it means that if you're doing a really heavyweight, high, high load job, then all of your small requests that are coming in at the same time are going to be slower because they're trying to contend for the CPU or whatever other resources with that heavyweight request. Right, so what effect does this have? Well, let's look at a simulation, or the results of a simulation anyway. Um, so the blue line here is a simulation of a, a random load balancer that I worked on and the green line is the actual distribution. So this is like, it's drawing again from that log normal distribution, it's doing that 1.15 sigma log normal distribution. Um, and so you can see that what happens is, like at the, at the lower end of the percentile range, they're actually pretty close to each other, right? It's as you get up higher and higher and higher in that percentile that they become more and more and more skewed, right? So it's a bit slower at the 50th percentile. At the 99th percentile, it's much, much, much slower than it should be based on the actual distribution. Does that actually matter? There's this really cool article. <laughs> uh, who, who here has heard of Guillotine before? There's a couple of you, awesome. Okay, you should all know about Guillotine. It like, writes really interesting things about latency and measuring latency and all of this sort of thing. Things that I care a lot about, anyway. Um, so this is an article by Guillotine, um, and what it's describing is that most page loads will hit the 99th percentile of latency for your web service. Like we think about 99th percentile, like measuring that 99th percentile as like the rare event. It's the thing that only happens every so often, every once in a while. It's like once in a blue moon, we're gonna hit the 99th percentile, but that's not actually the case. So let's look at why. So the probability of a single resource request Avoiding the 99th percentile is, of course, 99%. The probability of all end resource requests for a particular website avoiding that 99th percentile is 
to the nth power. So 99% to, in this case, let's say 69, ends up at 50%. We're very close to 50%, right? So that means if you have 69 requests on your website, like you're talking like the CSS, the JavaScript, all of the Ajax requests that are happening, you almost certainly do. Most websites at this point have significantly more. If you look at like Amazon, New York Times, Facebook, they all have almost 200 requests that happen when you first go to their site. Uh, CNN has almost 300. It's kind of crazy, right? Which means that not only are they hitting the 99th percentile, they're actually hitting the 99.9th percentile on most page loads, right? So 99th percent and higher actually matters. Like that long tail latency is actually really important. So what do we do about it? Well, um, there are things that are better than random, but um, it kind of comes back to those, those edge cases, those, those problems that we talked about before, as to like why you might not want to use these. Um, but in the optimistic case, um, one of the things that you could use is an algorithm called join shortest queue, um, which does, it, I believe, actually exist in a few of the open source load balancers these days. It's still not perfect because, it, again, it cannot possibly know how long the different requests are gonna take, but it can do a lot better. So in this case, we have the blue line being the random simulation, and we have the green line being the join shortest queue simulation. You can see that like that join shortest queue simulation matches what we expected from the actual request distribution, like request latency distribution much more closely. Um, so this can actually make a pretty, pretty cool improvement. So another way to look at this is from the, uh, is from the perspective of the application servers themselves. So what this chart is, which looks insane, and when I first generated this, I'm like, ooh, it's so pretty. I should make art. Um, so this is, this, is, uh, this is from the perspective of the application servers themselves. Um, this is the origin loads. This is how many requests are currently outstanding over time at each of our application servers in the simulation. Um, and this is, this is uh, what it looks like for random. And so what you, can, what you can kind of gather from this is that the variance is really high. Um, the, the darker red line there is the average at any particular time, and the black line is the standard deviation between them. And so you can see that like the standard deviation goes up, it means that like there's more variance between each of the different origin servers, and requests end up piling up. And this is, this is ultimately the reason why random ends up being bad in a lot of cases, because when you end up throwing a bunch of weight at one, the algorithm doesn't actually care about that, and it will keep sending requests to it and it'll keep being slow until eventually like it's, it slowly comes back down, right? So this is what you're seeing in that graph. <clears throat> um, and this is the, is that same graph, but for join shortest queue, right? And so in this case, you can see that like the origin servers that we have there are all much closer to each other at each time step. <clears throat> and the black line being the standard deviation is very, very low. And this is like, this is exactly what you want to see. This is like almost perfect. It's almost as good as we can get. Um, so for the case where you have one load balancer, join shortest queue is actually pretty cool. It works pretty good. It's about as good as we can do. So let's throw a wrench into this and talk about distributed load balancing. Most people run multiple load balancers. Um, I, I would assume that most of you do at this point, right? So like you're, you're actually, like you have your DNS set up so it's sending like requests randomly to a bunch of different load balancers because you don't want to have that single point of failure in there, right? Um, so let's, let's walk through this. How does, how does having multiple load balancers change all of this? Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it doesn't make everything harder. It actually, distributed random is, is great. And this is like probably one of my favorite things about random. It's identical. You make no changes. It is magically distributed. You just set them up. It's still random. Um, there's no communication necessary between the different load balancers. They're just doing their random thing. Um, yeah. However, Distributed join shortest queue is a freaking nightmare. Um, and, and the reason for this is because it's stateful. Because join shortest queue has to remember, it has to know how many requests are currently outstanding at every one of the origin servers at any time. And once you make that distributed, like all distributed things, as soon as you add state, it becomes a nightmare. Um, and specifically in this case, it's state that has to be shared. If you don't share it, or you don't use the information that's shared well, what you can end up with is this. 
Um, so this is the graph, that same type of graph of the load on the individual application servers using join shortest queue and then just like, just accepting it. Um, uh, let's see how to put this. Um, sorry, again, I said this is my first time giving this talk so I'm like gonna mess some stuff up. So this is join shortest queue where the application server, or where the load balancers are sharing the current load that each of them thinks that the application servers have but then using that information in a naive way. Um, in other words, it basically goes, okay, I just like, my other load balancer just said, oh, this, it, it thinks that this application server has five requests and I got that information about a second ago from it, so I'm gonna assume that it still has five requests on it or it still has zero requests on it. And so what you end up with, um, and, and this next graph is actually just the same one, we're just gonna pull it apart, is oscillations. And this is where that finger of death comes in, right? And so you can kind of see this, I, I probably should have like generated some slightly better ones here, but like, so you can see that like it's actually following curves, right? Where each of the load balancers think, oh okay, this server is currently completely unloaded, I'm gonna send all my requests to it. And then it hears from its other load balancer, oh, oh, oh wait, that server is really heavily loaded now and it takes all of its requests off of it and puts them on another one. And then it switches, like, and then just, this just happens over and over and over again. What you end up with is oscillations. Um, and so basically what it's doing is it's using information that's outdated. It's using information that it got a while ago that it thinks it's still relevant, but it's not because the world has changed since then. So what can we do about this? This is one of my favorite papers in the entire world. Um, so it's the power of two choices in randomized load balancing. It's from all the way back in 1991, and it's actually um, Mitzemacher's thesis, uh, it, which means it's really long. That's really just what a thesis means. Um, <laughs> so what he describes in this paper uh, is an attempt at doing join shortest queue or something similar to join shortest queue, but by adding in a randomization factor to it. So instead of Instead of just sharing that information between the servers and then just using it and assuming it's correct, what we do instead is we do this in two steps. Inst like in the case, uh, like it's blah. Just like random, we choose a server at random. But in this case, we actually choose multiple servers. So if we have eight, we might choose like, okay, we're gonna like pick two servers at random for each request that comes in. And then we look at those servers and go, which one do I currently think has the lower load? And you choose that one. Right? And so it's a combination of join shortest queue and random. And the really cool thing about this is that it completely kills off those oscillations and also exponentially reduces the, um, the variance of the balls and bins problem. And we'll walk through a little bit of this. But let's go back to that, um, so remember this code from earlier. This is like the last bit that we were working on. So this is modeling random load balancing with long, log normal request latencies. So let's try it with the algorithm from power of two. Uh, oh, right, yeah, so that, that's, what the, that's what the thing came out to there. Okay, right, so, um, wait, yes, okay. So, in this case, we didn't actually have to change much. I assume you saw that. We just added a couple lines there at the, near the end. Um, so first we pick an A server, then we pick a B server, and then we look and see which one is more heavily loaded, and we use the other one. And so what ended up happening? Looks like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, and so we can actually quantify this. Like, how much better is this? Uh, well, I mean, in this case, it's just it's just a simulation in a Python script. But um, but yeah, you can actually see like totally. You you see the very same effect when it is distributed as well. Like the longer the time between when they are communicating, like the worse it gets. But it's still like much, much better than not doing it. Um, so how much better is this though? Well, we, we can actually quantify this. Um, so the standard deviation of our top one here is 22.9. Standard deviation of the bottom one is 1.18. And so it really, really is an exponential improvement. Like this, this is why this is like one of my favorite papers in the world because like it takes such a like simple little concept and makes things so much better. <laughs> um, Oh yeah. Uh, you had, you had a thousand elements, right? Yes. Why are there more than one point five? Uh, can you repeat that question again? Sorry. Why are there, if you had a thousand elements, why are there more than one point five? Ah, 
right, so it's choosing them. It's, it's uh, right, so it's drawing, blah. Right, so it's not gonna be exactly 1,000 because it is still somewhat random, right? It's choosing those values from a, um, it's choosing those values from that log normal distribution, which means there is gonna be some randomness there, right? And I also rounded them off and such, so like, it, it should be close to 1,000 though, in this case. And so, if we go back to that, that same simulation that we were looking at earlier with random as the blue line, um, join shortest queue as the green line, and they randomize join shortest queue as the red line, you can see what it ends up doing is actually splitting the difference, um, which is a pretty huge improvement, especially as you increase the amount of load on servers. All right. Here's another crazy idea. All right, so this is, uh, oh wow, my animation didn't work. That's a bummer. Did it? No, all right, fine. So you're not actually gonna be able to read that, whatever. Uh, so this is a paper, it's called Join Idle Queue. Um, and this came out from Microsoft Research last year. And so what this does is it actually flips the random process on its head. Instead of um, the load balancer choosing app servers at random, the app servers actually notify the load balancers at random that they are available, that they are idle. So it's essentially saying, I'm idle right now, so give me requests. And the way it ends up working is that like, you know, if you have a set of load balancers, let's say you have eight load balancers and you have several hundred or several thousand computers underneath them, what, what they end up doing is they choose a couple at random. They choose a couple of the load balancers at random and just say, hey, I'm ready. Um, and so the argument there is that the app servers know better uh, whether or not, like what their, what their load actually is. They know better um, than the load balancer can know. That's the argument anyway. Um, and they quantified the results, which is that graph that, you know, popped up before it was supposed to. Um, and it, look, it looks pretty good. So in this case, like that, that line that they're looking at there is, uh, the, at the top is random as load is increasing on the system. And I thought this was really cool also because it like completely mimics exactly like what I found when I was doing my research as well, that, which is that like as the load, as the total like, as the load on the system, like the percentage of the load on the system increases, random especially gets worse and worse and worse really quickly. Um, and so, right, um, the SQ2, which is the line that is like in the middle, is actually the same thing as the randomized join shortest queue that we talked about earlier. So they're showing an improvement over the randomized join shortest queue, but I still think it's pretty cool because like that one's doing pretty well. Um, yeah. So my problem with this approach is possibly a difference of perspective. Um, the argument in the paper, again, is that the app servers know better what their load is. Um, my argument is that that doesn't matter. Um, the perspective that matters is actually the load balancer itself, because the load balancer is the one who knows what the origin to the user, or I'm sorry, what the latency to the user is. The app servers can't really know that. Um, it also leaves the load balancer like completely at the whim of misbehaving uh, application servers. Also, tight coupling systems, blah, blah, blah. There's a good chance I'm wrong, whatever. This might be like the wave of the future, but that's my personal opinion. Right, so why does any of this matter? Why do you care about any of this? This is just a bunch of like me rambling on stage. Um, well, I guess the primary reason is I found it really, really interesting as I was working on this and I hope that you guys did as well. Um, Right, so I guess the other point is like if you do want to go off and like write your own load balancer, you, you probably shouldn't try to find the perfect solution because it's not actually possible, which is a bummer, I know, but. Um, and there, the other, I think, takeaway from this is that there are options to make the ecosystem better in this particular realm. There are better ways to do load balancing than what we're doing that like avoid a lot of the edge cases while still improving, especially that long tail latency, quite a bit. Um, not many open source implementations exist though, so yeah, sh you, should, you should go write them. That would be really cool actually. Um, and also may help, ex may help explain performance issues that you see, especially as load increases on your servers. It may like, not really make sense initially, and then you realize that, ah, randomness is a problem. So, thanks. to take questions. And in future, please save your questions till after the talk. I'm looking at you, Izzy. <laughs> so
So uh, what, what, ex what is your opinion on how to load balance uh, persistent connections like web sockets or just sh straight up TCP sockets? And how would you best do that? Man, accents are hard. Um, <laughs> so you're asking how to, how to load balance persi persistent connections. No, I didn't say anything about persistent connections. Okay, then I, I heard No, no, nothing. I'm kidding, I did, I did. I was just, I was just messing with you. <laughs> Can you, can you ask it again then? I'm sorry. Sure. So if I had a green apple in this hand and a box in this <laughs> hand. <laughs> if, uh, if, so it's, um, what you've explained, uh, I, can, I can map that pretty easily to how uh, for, for short-lived connections, like HTTP requests. But if you're dealing with web sockets or just straight um, TCP sockets, like anything where persistence is needed and, the se and even, even, even more so where the session that the user is engaged on is tied to the state of the connection, yeah. How do you load balance that? So I think that is a, that's a comp like, totally valid question, but like completely different question um, as it happens. Like, so for the short-lived connections or, or like the load balancer perspective itself where it can choose to send the request to like different app servers even if they are part of the same connection, like this model that we're looking at works. For the, like the part where, um, where you actually have to like keep that connection open and like you know, the user's session is relying on that, this totally falls apart, and I don't, I don't actually know the answer. It wasn't part of the research I was doing, sorry. <laughs> so do I understand correctly in what you were saying um, about having uh, multiple uh, shortest queue uh, balances, in that the crux of the issue there is um, the latency of the uh, ba uh, balances sharing information with each other? Yeah, that's a lot of it, yeah. Okay. Um, have you uh, considered or looked at uh, trying to use some sort of uh, prediction algorithm that has a short-term memory? Uh, something springs, springs to mind would be a uh, neural network or some sort of feedback. So rather oh, than uh, working on uh, data that's uh, yeah. uh, out of date, you can use that slightly out of date data to sort of make your, make your prediction, <coughs> but do a best effort guess. Yeah. So, you, so, you, so you're in control rather than just introducing randomness again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a really interesting paper that I ended up cutting out of this talk at the last minute um, that was called, so it's actually also by Mitzenmacher, who the power of two choices was by, and it was called How Useful is Old Information? Then there's also a paper that is similar um, called uh, Load Interpretation. And what both of these algorithms do is uh, they again share that information at like some, some like period of time between each of the load balancers. But in addition to the, um, the current load on the application servers, what they pass around is the current request um, volume that they're seeing at any particular moment. And so with those two pieces of information, each of the load balancers can then make a prediction for like how will, how has the world changed since I got this particular information like maybe milliseconds ago, maybe seconds ago. Um, and so the interesting thing I think about that was like it did show improvement over joint shortest queue, but it wasn't really all that significant in most cases, um, which is a bummer, but. So it, uh, it, it wasn't worth the overhead kind of, kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. it like severely complicates the algorithm. I, I actually implemented a simulation of it and it took me quite a while. <laughs> cool, thanks. <laughs> We're right at the back here. Um, I actually have a, uh, something about the last argument you made about the load balancer having a more definitive version of the truth. And that is that similar to the weighted round robin algorithm, you can actually have um, application servers that think that they have a low latency, but actually it's just because they're nuking all the queries that come to them. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're serving healthy traffic. And if they start bending or polling and saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm ready, then you can actually create this black hole for traffic because you start serving or preferring them for traffic. So that's an, another argument about the load balancer because load balancer takes into account the whole sort of traffic received from those posts. Right. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And that's the exact same problem that I see with it, where uh, the load balancers will, or the application servers will think that they know better, but they're, they're wrong. <laughs> um, what you're talking about is a, a push model, right, of load balancing, where uh, you're trying to intelligently predict where, to, where the best destination is to send this request to. Yes. Um, but what if you turn the world upside down, right, where you actually have a pool model? Um, ah. You have a shared queue. Maybe you've got 100 servers, mm -hmm. and you group them into pairs of 10 at a time. And all your load balancers have to do is just put it in that queue for 10 of them. 
but they will go and fetch data at the rate at which they can. No, um, it's a totally different model, yeah. but, but I've seen it in, in, in production environments where it works extremely effectively. Oh, you're actually allowing the slaves to work, you're not stressing them out, they will, because some of the servers might be faster than others, right. and so one might run at 100 TPS, another at five, so and in this way you actually get optimal, optimal performance, optimal utilization of these machines. So I, I guess my, like, I had like tried to think about how I would do something like that, and the problem that I came up with was that uh, it, it actually, like, if you have to send a request to a load balancer to get a request, like the potential latency that that adds onto the entire process. Um, but like, I did, because of that, because I had that thought, I didn't actually go off and try it, and you might be totally right. So that's interesting. Thank you. I think Bridget has a question. Oh, okay, yeah. Check it. Um, just curious, with where the application is not necessarily that well trusted, can the data that it provides not be used to make a better, more intelligent decision about where the balancing will really go? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't totally follow the question. Where the, um, well, one more time, sorry. The application might not have the best data of yes. the overall big picture, but can its data not be used as a parameter for making a better decision? Yeah, so that's that's entirely fair. I think it could be. I think it could be used to make to help the um, to help the load balancer make a better decision. The problem that I have was when it was uh, the the sole source of information for it, um, because it could be that like you have an immense amount of like packet loss between like you and, uh, between the load balancer and that application server, and so that load that application server may be like totally idle and like willing to take requests, but it's still not worth it to send the like the request. Still not worth it to send the request there. Um, but I think combining the information could be really interesting. Yeah. Great talk. Um, so other than this exciting, you know, possibly fastly roadmap item of implement great <laughs> OSS version of Join Shortest Q, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what all this research led you to in terms of what you might either decide to change about how you're currently doing load balancing or, um, you know, what kind of improvements you, residual, you know, whatever side improvements you can make now that you know all of this. Right. So I think, I think the primary thing that, um, that, that I took away from all of this was, um, A, that like, I think most people don't actually know, like, that the load balancing can actually affect performance like it does. And I guess to, to like put a different spin on that though, maybe it doesn't matter that it's affecting performance. Like maybe using random because simplification is still worth it. Um, but I think it's one of those things where like it was interesting to me to realize that like there's a, there's a decision to make there. Like there's, there's a, there's a trade-off that's being made. Um, so as for, as for what it, uh, what else it changed about what I'm doing, uh, yeah, we probably have some roadmap items, it's cool. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, uh, really interesting. Uh, when I saw the, the spiky graph you showed uh, with the um, join shortest queue uh, distribution, uh, I was kind of expecting you to talk about PID as a method for controlling that, and I wondered why, uh, given that it must have come up, uh, it's not applicable in this case. Okay, right, oh, so the, this particular graph was like back, yeah, that one, right? Uh, yeah, it was actually the one where they were all separate, but yeah, that, oh, it's oh, the same one. question. Oh, right, so methods of controlling it, right. So uh, the whole like control theory, like way of handling this particular thing. Um, so one of the problems is I don't know control theory well. Um, <laughs> it's really hard, math is hard, man. Um, so I, I, I ended up in, in most of the cases, like I did some reading on that particular thing um, and then found like the power of two choices paper and found like the like load interpretation papers and things like that. Um, if you have ideas for how to use control theory to control this type of thing better, I would love to talk with you about it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know if you included in your modeling um, that sometimes the application service serves different kinds of service, obviously, um, that people typically push that through the same load balancer. So in your if you're expecting different kinds of responses from app servers, if you could isolate those of the, from the load balancing policy, that could have uh, a huge impact on the consumer performance. Yeah, okay, so that, that's a really interesting one because I know of, um, 
several very, very large like software companies that have tried to do this kind of thing, where they like actually manage like the operations team, the network team goes in and attempts to manually like assign some sort of like general weight to each of the different types of requests that comes in. And every time I've heard about them doing this, they're like, yeah, this is great and it works really well. And then like a couple years later, they end up ripping it all out because it was like a nightmare for them to end up maintaining. Um, but it does seem entirely reasonable that that could work and could improve it. It's just that it's like an operational overhead. Yeah. yeah. One more. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm just wondering if a round robin algorithm wouldn't give you the benefits of random without the risk? So that's an interesting question. Um, so round robin, um, so there, there's I think a couple portions of this. Um, round robin for the case where your requests are mostly the same latency is actually really good. You're totally right. Um, for the case where like you have a very high variance, which is that like certain sigmas for that log normal distribution, it ends up looking really, really similar to random. And then in the case where you have distributed load balancers, it becomes like basically exactly the same thing as random uh, because the requests are arriving at the load balancers at random, right? Um, but but for, the, like, for certain types of workloads, round robin totally is like completely reasonable and like super low overhead, so yeah. Yeah, because my thoughts was it would give you the benefits of, of round robin. Every server would have the same risk of getting a high load um, request mm -hmm. without the overhead and um, having to do or having a lot of risks. Right, so I think one of the other problems with yeah. round robin in this case is that like, you still have the chance of like, like having requests pile up at servers because round robin doesn't actually care how many requests are outstanding there and how heavy they are, right? So you still have that same chance but like, again, for certain types of workloads, it, it does work really well, so yeah. Anyway, all right, thank you. Thank you.